So thanks, uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, having me here. Always, I always like talking to a broad audience. So before we start, I'd just like to know how many of you um, have not studied biology after, say, 12th standard? Yeah, okay. How many have? About half? Okay. And how many of you, uh, so you, I gather that many of you are currently in the middle of your, your PhDs, more or less, or at least in, in your master's degree. How many of you are doing physics? Okay, mathematics, okay, chemistry, wow, okay. Um, anything I missed? Biology, biology, okay, how many biology? Yeah, okay, now anything I missed? Okay, fine. So you don't need to know any biology to come to follow my talk. You need to know a little bit of math for some of the slides, but uh, that covers material which I believe you've already seen during the school or things you might learn just tomorrow or day after tomorrow. So maybe this will whet your appetite for some of those uh, methods. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about something slightly different. So I've found that a lot of the work in computational biology these days still focuses on metabolic networks and genetic uh, regulation. But actually there's a whole spectrum of computational biology outside of these two subjects. For example, population genetics and, and so on. Um, and here's another example which you may not have seen so far, but it is increasingly common and uh, a growing area. It's looking at what's called membrane traffic. I'll explain what that is and uh, explain what we study about that. So this is a picture of a cell. It's a, it's a type of yeast cell. This is a, an electron micrograph we've taken in, at NCBS. One of my students took it. Um, you know, it's about uh, 10 microns across. All those things you see over there are mitochondria. That is its nucleus. That's its nuclear pore. Uh, you can see its cell surface is quite complicated too. So um, this is what's called a eukaryotic cell. Right? There are prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And eukaryotic cells are sort of bigger than prokaryotes and they have all this funny stuff on the inside. That's what this defines a eukaryotic cell. So here's a more zoomed in picture. It's taken by uh, a very famous cell biologist, George Palladi. Uh, again, an electron micrograph. What you see over here, so first of all, you see uh, this beautiful structure. And that's called the Golgi apparatus. Okay, it's, it, it looks like a set of pancakes that are sitting on top of each other, or a set dose, if you have that kind of thing. Um, but you slice it and you see these uh, cross-sectional patterns. Uh, and we'll be talking about the Golgi apparatus quite a lot later in the talk. You also see uh, these things, which are labeled V or C. These guys are what are called transport vesicles. They're about 40 or 50 nanometers across. They're little almost like bubbles, they're membrane enclosed bubbles, and they move things from one part of the cell to the other part of the cell. Okay, by the way, this is all cell membrane. They're all just lipid bilayer membranes. The outside of the cell, the ER, Golgi apparatus, the vacuoles, the vesicles, they're all surrounded by membrane. Okay, if there's any questions about any of this as we go through the talk, you can just ask me in the middle. I've left plenty of time for questions. Okay, so let's, um, let's see what comes, uh, oops. I don't know what I did there, but maybe, ah, okay, I must have blanked it out, good. So this thing, which I called a vesicle, if you actually zoom in on that, of course by then you can't really take a microscopic image of this, but this is a reconstruction, it's a computational guess of what a vesicle looks like. So that's a 40 nanometer vesicle, that sort of yellow green stuff in the middle is the membrane, and these things are proteins that are stuck in the membrane, Okay, and inside the vesicle there'll be other proteins and small molecules. Okay, so it's quite a complicated beast. And why is it so complicated? Um, well, so I'll explain a few things about this because a lot of these molecules have functions which uh, I'm not going to mention today, but a couple of them, in particular, these things called snares, like these guys, the synaptobrevins, um, or this thing called a RAB, which is that small molecule over there. These things are very important because they decorate the surface of different vesicles, okay? Different vesicles have different types of RABs, and different vesicles have different types of snares. And these RABs and snares are like the addressing system. It tells the vesicle where it should go. Okay? So, when you have a source compartment, which could be the endoplasmic reticulum, and you have a destination compartment, which could be the plasma membrane, or the Golgi apparatus, or a vacuole, from the source compartment, you make this vesicle. You make it by literally budding out the membrane. 
That's done by these molecules called coat proteins. And when you bud out the membrane, it'll contain internal cargo that came from here. It'll also contain transmembrane cargo like that. Okay, and then the coat goes away, and then this vesicle finds its way across the cell. Sometimes it diffuses, sometimes it goes on a cytoskeletal track, you know, almost like a railway track. But eventually it finds its acceptor compartment. It's somewhere else in the cell. Okay? And how does it know it's the correct acceptor? Because the acceptor has a bunch of molecules. Just like the vesicle has this addressing system, the acceptor has an addressing system. And if these two molecules like each other, then the vesicle will fuse. And if they don't like each other, it won't fuse. That means it went to the wrong place. Right? And once it fuses, it delivers the cargo. Are there any questions about this? It's very simple. You make a vesicle, depending on what's on the surface, it finds the correct target and then it delivers. Okay? So the properties of a vesicle, saying where it will go, are determined completely by what it takes away from this compartment. There's no other puppet master telling the vesicle where to go. Okay? It's a self-organized system. That's the most important thing you want to see from this slide. Okay? No questions? Fine. So this is just a source and a target compartment, right? But eventually you're talking about the whole eukaryotic cell. So this is a more zoomed out picture of the whole cell. That's the nucleus. That's the outer membrane. The cell is actually a big circle like that, right? It's just a little cross section of that. Um, the nucleus is contiguous. The nuclear membrane is contiguous with the endoplasmic reticulum, which is what that is. Then you have the famous Golgi apparatus again. And then you have all kinds of other stuff going on. And part of what the cell does is it makes proteins on the surface of the ER and inside the ER, and it exports them to the outside of the cell. Now, if you want a protein to go out of the cell, right, because of the topology, you need to send it inside the ER. Because if it's inside the ER, it'll be inside this vesicle, it'll be inside these vesicles, it'll be in the gray zone. And when a vesicle then fuses with the outside, that gray zone becomes part of the outside world. Okay, so it's very important to understand if you want a protein to go outside, you can't just send it outside the membrane. It's imp almost impossible to punch a hole in the membrane and send the protein through. The only way you can do it is actually to make the protein inside the ER and send it out. So that's called secretion. There's another entire pathway by which cells actually make vesicles from the cell surface and take it inside. Can anybody guess why a cell would want to do that? Why would you want to make a vesicle on the surface and take stuff inside? Yeah, why? Nutrients. Why do you want to take nutrients into the cell? Hmm? But, you know, I don't want the technical words. I want to understand why a cell would need to take nutrients. Are there cells that don't do this kind of thing? Are there any types of cells that don't do this kind of thing? What? Almost all cells don't do this type of thing. What am I talking about? Okay. Bacteria. So if bacteria can survive without doing all this, why should eukaryotes do this? Very simple question, to which you must have an answer. No. Yeah, so do, pro yeah, so do prokaryotes. So? You're just repeating facts. I want to understand why. Yeah? Why do you need to take stuff inside? Bacteria can eat food when it's outside, somehow. But eukaryotes have taken it. Now, I'm not going to answer the question. I'm just saying that, see, you have to keep asking very simple questions. If people start throwing all kinds of complicated stuff at you, and you just accept all this complicated stuff, then as soon as you leave this room, you won't remember anything. But if you think about a couple of simple questions at least, and answer them for yourself, at least that you'll remember for Hopefully a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of years, maybe long. Anyway, I'm not going to explain why. Um, but yes, it has to do with nutrients. So some stuff comes inside and other stuff goes outside. Why should cells want to send proteins out? Little, yeah, hormones for communication, for example. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of proteins need to go out, a lot of proteins need to come in. Okay? And these vesicles, they all, you know, these different colors represent different coats. And different types of vesicles are made in different parts of the cell and they connect different parts of the system. Now, this is just a cartoon, right? It's hard to see who is connected to whom. But cell biologists have studied all this, and they say this type of vesicle, which is a COP1 vesicle, actually goes backwards in the Golgi apparatus. The COP2 vesicle goes from the ER to the first Golgi plate, which is called the cis-Golgi. 
cis Golgi, medial Golgi, trans Golgi, then these type of vesicles, which are clatherin coated vesicles, go outside and they come inside in this part of the system, closer to the surface of the cell. So it's very, very complicated. Okay, and of course, it's so complicated that it really deserved a Nobel Prize, which was given actually rather recently, 2013 was the Nobel Prize for people who, well, Schechtman, Sudoff, um, and Rothman, who discovered the molecules that make all this work. Fine. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, address only a very small part of this entire network for the purposes of today's talk, because you have to start somewhere. So I'm going to focus on the Golgi apparatus. Okay, the Golgi apparatus has all these different pieces, the cis, the medial, the trans, and there are many copies of the Golgi apparatus throughout the cell. Just like there's many mitochondria throughout the cell, there's many Golgi apparatuses throughout the cell. Okay, and in many organisms, actually, the Golgi doesn't look like the stacked morphology. It looks like that in our cells, but for example, in yeast cells, it doesn't look like that. So here's an example of a yeast cell, and I'm going to show you something quite interesting here. This is not an experiment we did, it's uh, uh, a paper which is now about 10 years old. Um, so this is a, a standard microscope image of a yeast cell. What they've done is they've labeled the Golgi apparatus, but they've used two kinds of proteins. They've used one kind of protein that is in the cis Golgi, which is the first plate, and they've used a different kind of protein which is in the medial Golgi. Okay, so these are called the cisternae, right? So you notice what's happening here? Can somebody see and tell me what's happening there? What's happening with that arrow? A little louder. It's turning from green to red. In fact, it's doing something slightly more interesting. It's green, then it has red and green, then it becomes red. Okay, so another example here. It's green, then it's red and green, then it becomes red. If you actually quantify the fluorescence profile, first you see a green peak, then you see a red peak, right? And you can see it in many places, another green peak, another red peak. What's happening here is very interesting. What it's actually saying is when you go back to this picture, this picture is actually wrong. In fact, one of the best ways you know a picture is wrong is if it's in a textbook. It's in a textbook, it's wrong. Because textbooks change very slowly and biology changes much more rapidly. Okay, so how can this phenomenon be reconciled with this phenomenon? Why am I saying that this picture is wrong? They've taken a protein that labels the cis Golgi, which is a green protein. They've taken a protein that labels the medial Golgi, which is the red protein, but somehow they swap over. So how, what does that mean about this? How do you interpret that? They're on top of each other, but how? They are on top of each other. What does that mean about this cartoon? How is it that a protein from here goes over there, that protein comes here? It's not because it's 2D, good guess. Okay, so what does it mean in particular? This picture shows that these compartments are static, right? They're always there. Like the nucleus is always there. The cell surface is always there. This picture says it's always there, but one is converting to another. So this experiment proves, proves what? It proves that actually this compartment, if you wait a couple of minutes, actually becomes this compartment. It changes composition. If this compartment becomes that compartment, how do you get another copy of this compartment? Maybe it changes back, maybe it just keeps going back and forth. Any other options? You can also make this compartment. That's what's going on here. This thing called ergic, it's called the ER Golgi Intermediate Compartment. It's actually this compartment about to be formed. So this one starts to get formed. If you wait a few minutes, it looks like that. If you wait a few minutes, it looks like that. If you wait a few minutes, it looks like that. And then, then what happens? It just breaks up, right? So just by looking at this picture, you would never guess that, right? That's why this is wrong. If you ever, ever see a static picture of a cell, it's almost certainly wrong, right? It's dynamic, and what's happening is that each one of these things becomes the next one. If this compartment is going to become that one, where does it get all the, when, when I say it becomes, I mean it, some proteins used to be here, right? And those proteins sort of stick around as it goes through, but other proteins start replacing what it already had. Now imagine you're a piece of cargo that's sitting in this compartment to begin with. By the time you get to here, 
have you ever left the compartment? You never leave. Cargo itself that's inside never leaves the compartment. Instead, what happens is the enzymes come to you, right? On a factory floor, usually the product keeps moving and the factory workers are just sitting over there. But another way to do it is that you keep the product over there and the workers keep going the other way. Okay? And that's what's going on here. So that is called, oh, it's happened again. Ah. So that is called cisternal maturation. And I've spent a lot of time talking about it because I want you to understand that it is a complicated process. It is an unexpected process. It was only discovered recently and it's still very controversial. Okay, it's called cister cisterna means plate. It's one plate of the Golgi and the cisterna mature. They don't just sit there and don't change at all. The first one becomes the second, becomes the third, becomes the fourth on a sort of few minutes time scale. Now, we actually try to model cisternal maturation. We bring to it a sort of biophysical approach. So let's see how we can do it. In fact, the great thing about ICTS is they give you blackboards. So we can actually do this while we're giving the talk. So how do I model cisternal maturation? I have to have some understanding that different compartments are labeled by different markers. Right? The cell biologists use green and red markers. You might, can imagine many, many markers. There are actually thousands of proteins in the Golgi apparatus. Thousands. You could use any one of them as markers. But just to keep things simple, let's talk about a two marker system. In this case, I've got two types of molecules, X and Y. Okay, and I imagine a cell contains large numbers of these compartments. Okay, and they also contain little vesicles. And the vesicles are coming out of compartments and they're going into compartments like that. Look, I want to model all this. How do I have a language where I can model all this? It looks quite complicated. So what I want to do is to have a single object, a mathematical object that captures most of what's going on here. No, almost impossible, right? Unless I model things from a nanometer scale all the way up to a micron scale. So what kinds of things do I want to ignore? I'm going to ignore the size of a compartment, the shape of a compartment. I'm going to ignore the location of a compartment. I'm just going to look at its composition. Okay? If I'm just looking at its composition, then I can make a graph like this. Okay? and say how many copies of X does the compartment have and how many copies of Y does the compartment have. Since there's only two types of molecules, I could say how many copies of each type it has. Yeah? So a single compartment, let's say this one, might be here, might have lots of X and Y. Maybe this compartment has lots of Y but no X. Right? And so on and so forth. There could be many types of compartments. So instead of a cartoon like this, I now have a mathematical description where I have lots of compartments in the cell and each compartment has a composition. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So that's what I call n x comma y. n x comma y is a two dimensional histogram. It says, how many compartments do I have with exactly this many molecules of X and exactly this many molecules of Y? I can imagine breaking this up into little squares and counting how many compartments there are in each square. Okay, so it's just a two-dimensional histogram. And to simplify my life in a huge way, I'm just going to say that vesicles by definition are the smallest possible compartments, which means how many X's or Y's do they have? Either one X or they have one Y, right? So let's say this is zero, one, two, three, and so on. This guy, I'm going to call an X vesicle. And this guy, I'm going to call a Y vesicle. Okay? Good. So that's what I've written over here the number of X vesicles is just the one comma zero component of the histogram. The number of Y vesicles is just the zero comma one component of the histogram. Yeah? What else do we know? How much total X molecules are there? Well, that's very easy. It's just N X comma Y times X. It's just the, you just sum up. How many molecules have one copy of X? Well, how many have zero copies of X? They don't contribute anything. 
Okay, you could have thousands of compartments, zero copies of x, they don't add to the total. Suppose there are 10 compartments with one copy of x, you add 10 to the left side. Suppose there are five compartments with two copies of x, again you add 10 to the left side. Right, and you keep on going. So this is the total amount of x, that's the total amount of y. And because I'm working at rapid time scales of minutes, I'm assuming that x and y do not get synthesized or degraded, they just move around. So in fact, x total and y total are completely conserved. They don't change. Okay, very simple stuff. Now here's the interesting thing. I want to specify the dynamics. I'm going to say what reactions are allowed to happen and how that affects the system. Okay, so imagine that I have two little x vesicles. There's one copy of x, there's one copy of x, and suppose they fuse to make a compartment with two copies of x. That's what the first line is here. Forget this word, homotypically, it means they're the same vesicle. Two x vesicles fuse to create a compartment. If that's the case, how does the histogram change? The number of x vesicles goes down by two. The number of compartments with two x's and zero y's goes up by one. Yeah? Similarly, what happens if a compartment buds a vesicle, it gives away an X or a Y vesicle, that's also very easy. Here the number of X vesicles goes up by one, then what else happens? Why, why are there two terms here? The number of compartments is exactly X molecules of X and Y molecules of Y goes down by one, right? So you have compartments with some number of molecules of X, let's say uh, three molecules of X and four molecules of Y. Now suppose it gives away an X vesicle, then what happens to it? It becomes a compartment with two molecules of X and four molecules of Y. So the number of compartments here goes down by one, the number of compartments here goes up by one. Yeah, so that's what that term is. Here is the same thing for Y, okay? What else can happen? Well, a vesicle could fuse to a compartment. So that's the same thing, number of X vesicles goes down. Again, the number of compartments are exactly X and Y go down, but now you move in this direction. Right, the number of x plus one comma y goes up, or the number of x comma y plus one goes up, okay? So this is all very simple stuff. The interesting thing is to say what the rate it is at which these reactions happen. Now I believe you've gone through at least some lectures on stochastic processes. So this is called the reaction propensity, right? The probability per unit time that some reaction happens. So given all the compartments that are floating around, I want to calculate the probability per unit time that something happens. So let's see if we can understand some of this. This is kind of interesting. There's some prefactor which is just a constant, right? The rate at which two vesicles fuse is n times, with nx times nx minus one. Can someone tell me why? So? Why nx, nx minus one? Yeah. Hmm? Subsequent one, close, 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 little more clearly. That's the total number of pairs. Out of nx vesicles, how many pairs can you choose? Yeah, very easy. What about this one? Why is the rate at which a compartment buds proportional to nx comma y? If there are more compartments with that many molecules, then the rate at which any one of them will bud goes up. That's why there's an nx y term. That's why there's an nx y term over here. What about here? The rate at which a compartment fuses to a vesicle. That's proportional to how many vesicles there are and how many compartments there are. Yeah? So that's just basic stuff. The other things are a bit more subtle. And here I've used some amount of biological knowledge. I know that the more x you have, the more the chance you'll bud a vesicle. So there's a prefactor of x, similarly for y. Here I've done something very tricky. Okay, so this let's study a little bit. I've said that the rate at which an x vesicle fuses to a compartment is an increasing function of x and a decreasing function of y. Okay, this thing increases with x and then saturates, but it decreases with y. I put that in by hand. Here, I've said the rate at which a Y vesicle fuses to a compartment also increases with X. So X in some sense promotes the fusion of vesicles. But Y is somehow inhibiting it. Okay, so I just wanted to give you some inkling of what all these terms mean. We can stop over there. Now, if you guys are sufficiently following me, even so late in the day, you'll see the following thing. Instead of doing all this, I could imagine that there's some bunch of compartments all over the cell. And I just want to focus on one of those compartments. 
since the compartments never talk to each other, they only talk to each other through the vesicles, as long as the number of vesicles is roughly constant, that's why I put nx bar and y bar, I could imagine just studying the behavior of a single compartment. So this is called mean field theory. Yeah? So, well, let's look at it. If I'm looking at a single compartment and I know the number of x vesicles, right, what is the rate of increase of x on that compartment? Well, it's just the rate at which I acquire x vesicles. So it's a times nx bar times x squared over x plus y squared minus the rate at which you lose x vesicles, minus b times x. Similarly, the rate of change of y on a single compartment is just the rate at which you get the y vesicles minus the rate at which you lose y vesicles, all the while assuming that the x and y vesicle number is constant. Why do I think it's constant? Because I think after a while the system settles into some sort of equilibrium. Okay? Now I leave this as a homework problem, but do take it down for notes. If you take these differential equations, okay, and I don't know if you've done this already, but you do your standard linear stability analysis. That means you find out what is the steady state. You set the left side to zero. Right? At the steady state, you then find out the eigenvalues or the Jacobian, however you want to think about it. Right? And then you find out under what conditions that steady state becomes unstable. So I can tell you this system has one steady state, but it becomes unstable under this condition. Okay? And you, you might want to read this and see what that means. Right? It becomes unstable if this is rather large, so B is quite a bit bigger than D or if this is rather large. Okay, so D is greater than C. It, it means something about the rates of budding and fusion. Okay, under these conditions, what happens? Under these conditions, no compartment will have a steady state. So what do you think happens? So let's go into it. Any questions about this? I'm not going to get back to this later. Yeah? So this, all I'm trying to show you here is that the tools you've learned already, you know, in a very simple, straightforward way, can be used to make mathematical models that are quite relevant for open problems in biology. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is skip all this and instead show you, I'll show you what this histogram looks like, but instead of doing it using these equations, I'm going to do it using a simulation. I'm going to use it, do it using a Gillespie algorithm, which again some of you might have studied. If you haven't studied, it doesn't matter. It's a way of simulating the stochastic process where individual compartments can bud and fuse and, right? You get, every time you run it, something different happens. That's what it means to be stochastic. So when I do that, here's what I get. This is the histogram I promised you, right? There's X's, there's Y's, each little square says there's that many molecules, there's that many compartments with that many molecules of Y and that many molecules of X. The more white it is, the more compartments there are. Okay? And the black and white part is the result of the stochastic simulation. And I want you to notice a few things. What, what structure do you see in the black and white part? Forget the colored lines. What structure do you see in the black and, black and white part? What's the, what are the few biggest things you see over there? A little louder, I can't hear. No, no, you don't see that in the black and white part. You're imagining things. So you should be able to describe this in simple English, so tell me. They gradually, there's a lot of fading out, right? so this is certainly not uniform. Well, okay, there's a lot more Y over there and there's less whiteness over here, very good. Anything else? You use your observation and descriptive powers. Two, ah, you, so you see this thing here and you see this thing there, so there's certainly sort of two peakish locations. Absolutely. Anything else? You shouldn't just look at the white bits. You should always look at the negative spaces. What else do you see? Ah, so you see nothing over there. Where else do you see nothing? There's another big patch of nothing. Yeah, here's a very surprising patch of nothing. Yeah? Good. Right, just simple observations. You should never forget your... Mathematical sort of terminology is totally meaningless, right? It's just words. Better to get some intuition. So what do you see over here? If I hadn't drawn that, yeah, that circle, I really should have given this figure without that circle, so you could have seen it. Doesn't matter. Uh, what you see is a sort of donut shape, 
right? Except that there's a hole over here. There's really nothing over here by definition because once you get to zero, zero, I just ignore the compartment. Okay, that's a bit of a fake thing, right? Other than that, you see vesicles, that's an X vesicle, that's a Y vesicle, and you see this sort of open shape over there, and there's nothing there, and there's no hole over here. Good. That's the stochastic simulation. That's the distribution of the histogram. Instead of the distribution, what if I follow in my stochastic simulation a single compartment in X and Y space? What would that look like? So even to plot that is difficult, right? Because I have to plot a three-dimensional thing. I plot X and Y dimensions as a function of time. Or I can simply plot the X dimension and the Y dimension as a function of time, which is what I plotted here. Here I've rescaled it so that both the plots have roughly the same height. So a single compartment, what happens to it? Dark is X, light is Y. Can you tell me what you see over there in simple English? It's out of phase, good. X and Y are out of phase. What else happens? What happens, so I've actually helped you out here. I've broken this up into three sort of different regimes. The orange or brown regime, the blue regime, and the black regime. What's happening during the orange regime? You can actually see it over here. What happens? Not lots of X less of Y. That's a static picture. What else happens? Tell me dynamically. Yeah, new compartments are forming, and what? X goes up and Y doesn't change. X is rising fast, and Y is hardly doing anything. Right, that's this brown bit. What happens during the second phase? X is going down, Y is going up. That's why you get this totally opposite behavior. What's happening in the third phase? X is already gone, Y goes down. Right? And this keeps on happening again and again. And if you notice, that's pretty much what you get over here. Yeah? X goes up, nothing happens to Y. X goes down, Y goes up, then Y goes down. Right, these are the experiments. This is the model. Doesn't mean the model is correct. How come the model does this? Because I made it do it. Right? I, I want it to at least reproduce that part of the experiment. It's nice that you can do it with such a simple model. Which part of the model did I have to work hard with to make this work? Right. The most difficult part of the model, it took me a while, is that one. Yeah? It's not the only model that will do this. Okay? So, of course, to really prove a model is correct, you have to do all kinds of tests. Secondly, how do I know my understanding of the model, no matter if the model is right and wrong? If you give me the model, how do I know my understanding of the model is at least correct? The way I know that is my differential equation predicts the very same behavior as my stochastic simulation, even though my stochastic simulation is so much more complicated. So that mean field idea that I can think of a single compartment and it's moving around even though all the others are dynamic, I'm ignoring all the changes, that's what mean field theory is. It is working because my deterministic solution, that last one is actually from the ODE. That last one is the solution of this, for constant nx and ny. And you see that it exactly, well, qualitatively reproduces what's happening here and it gets all the heights and everything correct. The other way to see it is that this is simply this limit cycle. And you can see the limit cycle nicely captures where the white stuff happens. And although there is, you know, quite a lot more to explain in the stochastic model. Okay? So I think my Hopf equation and all that stuff is sort of right. And so I know, in particular, that the way I should think about this black and white picture is that there are three phases. One, two, and three. So if I wanted to just memorize something simple about this, the way I think about it is, this little object, which is a small vesicle, that contains some x and no y, which I call 1, comma 0. That is literally a vesicle with one molecule of x and zero molecules of y. Now I'm saying I don't have to really keep track of how many x and how many y molecules. I can just keep track of does it have a lot of x, does it have a lot of y, or neither, or both. So I can abstract everything into zeros and ones. It's binary, right? If I wanted to do that, how would I look at it? I would say it has a little vesicle, which is that white small circle, becomes a compartment with a lot of x and very little y. That compartment in the second phase becomes a compartment with a lot of y and very little x. And that compartment in the third phase becomes nothing. It breaks up into small vesicles. Okay? Is everybody following me here? 
So any given compartment's life history, I can just take it as saying it was made from a little vesicle, it became a big compartment, it became another type of compartment and then it died. Can you see how this relates to the maturation model? It is first made, then it matures, then it decays. This is like a Golgi apparatus with just two cisterni. It's made, then it matures, then it decays. Okay? Fine. So if I wanted to make a cartoon of this, if I wanted to make a cartoon of this with even more abstraction, we've already abstracted quite a bit, right? With even more abstraction, I would say all I have to do is to keep track. There are only two types of compartments. There's the one zero compartment, there's the zero one compartment. There are only two types of vesicles, the X vesicle and the Y vesicle. Mainly the X vesicle fuses to make the X type of compartment. Yeah, that's what this brown arrow means, it's the creation step. Then what happens once you have an X type of compartment? How come it loses all its X? What, is, what must it be doing if it's losing X? Must be giving out what type of vesicles? So it must be giving away X type vesicles, right? That's what this arrow is. Then you become this type of compartment. Now, how can that compartment become this? What must it be doing? It must be giving away Y type of vesicles. Where are those Y type of vesicles going? must be going back to this compartment because you see it's gaining Y. So this is a little summary just for mental note. This is just a little summary of this picture. Can I, it's just like a rotated version of that picture. Everybody happy with this? Okay, I'm going to push you even further now. So you better be very comfortable with this picture. This picture's got two different things going on. If I just take a very quick snapshot of the cell, not on a time scale of minutes, but on a couple of seconds time scale, which of these arrows will I be able to observe? A couple of seconds time scale, which of these arrows will I be able to observe? Little louder, I can't hear. Hmm. If you want to raise your hands, yes? The black ones, those are the only ones, because this guy is giving, you know, hundreds of vesicles per second, this one's giving hundreds of vesicles per second. So in a one or two second snapshot, you'll definitely see vesicles being made and vesicles fusing. It takes much longer for one vesicle to fuse with a bunch of others to make a compartment. It takes several minutes in this case. It takes much longer for this compartment to become that compartment. So there are two time scales going on here. One is the rapid time scale of vesicle exchange. The other is the slow time scale of compartmental maturation, creation and maturation. So that's how you read this little cartoon. Okay? But at the moment it's still a cartoon. Now I'm going to show you something quite magical. So if we're comfortable with this, I'm going to the next slide. Anybody? All right. Here's the funny thing. Instead of doing that complicated differential equation or stochastic budding and fusion model, the differential equation approximation, the Hopf bifurcation, the Gillespie simulation, instead of doing all that, you can just get this cartoon from a much simpler model. What is that model? It is the following. I'm going to teach you how to read this. It's fairly, fairly complicated. I'm going to imagine that any compartment in the cell, I'm just going to keep track of it as 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, or 1, 1. Not vesicles. I'm going to ignore the vesicles altogether because they happen fast. I'm going to keep track of only the compartments and then only keep track of roughly does it have more X or more Y or more of both. So how many types of compartments can we have? Four, but the 0, 0 I'm not even counting, right? There's only three. So how many types of compartments are there? There's zero, one, one, zero, one, one. That's what C means. There are three types of compartments. Now each type of compartment, how many types of vesicles can it give out? Again, three, right? Zero, zero means there's no vesicle. Now can the zero, one compartment give out a one, one vesicle? It doesn't have any Y. That's why this place is blank. So in fact, that gray area represents all the types of vesicles a compartment could give out. Now a cell doesn't give out everything it could possibly have from every compartment. There are other proteins that regulate it. So I've drawn in ones all the types of vesicles that are given out by every type of compartment. Okay? So the way to read this is the zero one compartment gives out the zero one vesicle. The one zero compartment gives out the one zero vesicle. And the 1, 1 compartment gives out the 0, 1 vesicle and the 1, 0 vesicle, but not the 1, 1 vesicle. 
Because in this case, we're assuming that's also a possibility. Right? We've moved to a slightly, in one sense, we've abstracted, but now we've become a slightly more complicated. In my model here, vesicles only had some x and some y. But now I'm assuming that you can also have a small vesicle with x and y, since you're not making it. Okay? And it's called G because the mnemonic I'm using is budding. Budding, capital G. Right, so that's the G matrix. And what do you think the F matrix means? F stands for? Fusion, right? So how do you read this? It means, again, there are three types of compartments, three types of vesicles. Who can fuse to whom? The one zero compartment can fuse to the zero one vesicle. Okay? But nobody else can fuse. And the only last piece I'm assuming is if there's a large number of vesicles of a certain type and they don't find any way to fuse, I assume that they all fuse together to make a compartment because they all accumulate in one part of the cell and eventually homotopic fusion will take over. That's the only last part, okay? That's the model. So now let's see, based on those assumptions, no computer, no uh, linear stability analysis, nothing. Just pen and paper, let's see what the dynamics are. Okay, everybody ready? So this is the first type of cell. That's the initial condition. In the first time point, I assume you have one compartment with one zero, one compartment with zero one. I know that the zero one guy gives out the zero one vesicle because it's here. I know that the one zero guy gives out the one zero vesicle because it's here. I know the zero one vesicle can fuse to the one zero compartment because it's here. And I know the one zero vesicle can't fuse anywhere. So what happens in the next time point? Well, I told you the one zero vesicle doesn't fuse anywhere. So it becomes the one zero compartment. Yeah? What happens to this compartment? Can anybody tell me why it's doing this funny thing? It's getting zero one, so it must get one in the second position. And it's losing one zero, so it must lose zero in the first position. So it becomes zero one. What happens to this compartment? It gives everything away, so it goes away. That's it, we've covered everything now. Now what's cool about this is that I've actually shown you a steady state. This particular initial condition happens to be a period one steady state of a dynamical system. It's finely tuned and not all initial conditions are steady states. But this one happens to be. And because it's a steady state, the second state is the same as the first state, I can imagine just taking the second copy, putting it on top of the first copy, and making all the arrows wrap around. When you do that, what do you think you get? This is what you get. So this cartoon is exactly the same as this. This little vesicle becomes that compartment. That compartment becomes this compartment. This compartment dies. Right, do you see that? So this cartoon is the same as this one. So this is not just a cartoon now. It's an actual result of another type of model with the same intuition. But now what's the cool thing? Now, because I've abstracted away a lot of the complexity of this, I can actually imagine more complicated ingredients. I can imagine a three molecule system. Right? How many compartments in three molecule system? How many types? Seven. It's two to the three minus one types of compartments. Here they are. Here's all the ways that a compartment could give a vesicle. Can anybody see a pattern there? If I made a very big diagram where I said, oh, you know, why is this white? It's because 101 cannot come from a 011 vesicle because the first component is missing. Yeah? So the gray is just a logical operation. It says, is the vesicle a subset of the compartment? If I make a very big matrix with, let's say, 2 to the 10, that is 1,000 here and 1,000 there, what kind of shape do you think the gray will make. You might have seen it somewhere before. If I make 2 to the 10, or oh, this is the other, the other matrix called fusion, budding and fusion. If I make for a budding matrix 2 to the 10 compartments and 2 to the 10 vesicles, and said which vesicles are allowed to come from which compartments and colored them in gray, can you guess what kind of shape it's going to make based on what you see here? Who said that? Sierpinski. The triangle, exactly what it makes. And so on. It's a, it's a little fractal structure. 
and so on, all the way down to a single pixel. Right? You notice a sort of pixelated version of a Sierpinski triangle, very well spotted. So that's kind of cool. It's not useful, but it's kind of cool. OK, so now here's the interesting thing. I put a bunch of ones and zeros here, essentially at random, saying which vesicles can come from which compartments, which vesicles can fuse to which compartments, but with a three molecule system. Very difficult to simulate, very difficult to do hop bifurcation. It's a three dimensional thing. It's almost impossible to do it by hand. So let's see what happens. I start off with this initial condition 101, 011, 111. Let's follow through very carefully. 101 gives out 101 because I can read that here. 101 gives out 101. Okay, and it doesn't get anything else as it happens. So it'll go away in the next time step. 011 gives out 001, gets 101, and gets 010. What do you think happens to it? Well, it's getting the first one, so that should become one. It's losing the last one, but it's also getting the last one, so it's still getting it. And the middle one, which got it, is getting it, no problem. So it becomes 111. Similarly, 111 becomes 101 because you see, it gives away 010 and 011, but it gets one back, the third one back from this guy. So that becomes this. This has nowhere to go because if you look it up, it cannot fuse to any of these compartments. Might be able to fuse to some other compartment if it had been there, but it can't fuse to any of these compartments. So it becomes its own compartment in the next time step. Again, I've shown you, because I calculated it, a steady state. And that steady state, if I wrap it around, has this kind of picture. It's a bit more complicated. Right? But basically, this guy becomes that compartment by homotypic fusion. This compartment becomes that, this becomes that, and gives it away. This is starting to look much more like the Golgi apparatus. How did I get this? I put in these numbers by hand. And then I put in the steady state by hand to get this. So I cheated. So the real question is, what if I fill the entries of this matrix at random among all the allowed entries? Let's say half the grays have to be 1, or 0.1 of the grays. There's some problem with it. You take some p, and say some fraction of these have to be 1s, and some fraction of these have to be 1s. Then I start with some random initial condition. Then I let the system evolve. If it gets the first one and loses the second, the next time step, it becomes whatever it should become, keeps on going. Eventually, such a system, because it is a discrete dynamical system in a discrete space, reaches what's called a periodic fixed point. It will always reach a state where it's in some sort of periodic cycle. But a cell, usually, except for the cell cycle, the membrane traffic system of cell is not in a big periodic cycle. It's in a period one fixed point. And so when I do these simulations, I only keep the period one fixed points, and then I see what I get. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next slide. Right? So here is a seven molecule system. How many types of compartments can there be? 127. How many types of vesicles can there be? 127. Here's the fusion matrix. Roughly 10% uh, or, no, actually roughly 25% of the zeros and ones, of, of the allowed ones are made into one, right? Here you see that Sierpinski triangle, but not fully fleshed out, because only some of the allowed ones are there. When I take these matrices, and I take a random initial condition, and I run the system, and I look for a period one fixed point, I find this thing. Just an example. Right? You would never be able to do this with a differential equation system. Right? Your computer would be fried, or your brain would be fried, one or the other. So the only reason I show you this is because, as it happens, this is what a real cell looks like. That is a cell biologist's cartoon of a real cell. What happens? The ER gives out vesicles that become the ER Golgi intermediate compartment, which matures into the cis Golgi, the medial Golgi, the trans Golgi, matures into the trans Golgi network, which gives away a bunch of vesicles and vanishes. The plasma membrane gives a bunch of vesicles which fuse to make the early endosome, which becomes the late endosome, which becomes the lysosome, where a lot of stuff is digested. Some of that stuff goes back to the recycling endosome, which sends stuff back to the plasma membrane. This is a real cell. This is a fake cell, which I didn't fine tune. Okay, I just picked it out. Now you could ask, how hard do you have to work to make this kind of thing? This is what I've shown over here, right? You can take, 
I, can, I have generated tens of thousands of such cells from tens of thousands of random rules. It doesn't take long at all. It's Boolean. And for each such cell, which it is a fake cell, I can just plot some order parameter of that cell or some state variable. So just like in thermodynamics or statistical physics, where you take all possible configurations of molecules in a room, and then you plot some average parameters, like the pressure, the volume, and the temperature. So here for every cell, I'm plotting the fraction of homotypically fusing vesicles and the fraction of maturing vesicles, or the number of compartments and the number of maturation chains, stuff like that. I can plot many order parameters, and I get these densities. Those little dots are all possible vesicles that are simulated, and you see a lot of structure over here. Now, the real cell happens to be sitting at that point, that point, and that point in this high dimensional density. So you see that it's not a crazy sample. It's not a highly unlikely sample. It's an extremely likely sample of a randomly generated vesicle traffic network. Right? So just let this sink in. If I randomly generate a vesicle traffic network and I just pick it out, it is statistically indistinguishable from a real cell. at least as far as the topology of the vesicle traffic network goes. How do I prove this? this? This idea of statistical indistinguishability. I can't just look at these order parameters, because what we have is a very complicated network, right? So if we wanted to prove that this network is like that network, how would you prove it to me? Well, first of all, it has the right number of compartments and the right number of vesicles. That's how I chose it. Similar topology, well, it doesn't, right? It doesn't have a similar topology. Network analysis properties like what? So maybe the diameter, yeah, clustering coefficients, maybe in degrees and out degrees, average in degrees and out degrees. You could do all kinds of things, okay? But what we did was something slightly higher level than that. We looked at network motifs. What is a motif? It's, a, it's because there are many types of arrows, right? So just looking at in-degree, are you going to look at the in-degree of the blue arrows or the brown arrows or just the black ones or black and brown? So it's hard to say, right? Instead, let's look at the entire motif involving small numbers of compartments. For example, let's look at motifs with just three compartments. What kinds of motifs of three compartments occur in this cell or in the tens of thousands of other cells we've generated? When you do that over the entire simulation, you find certain motifs are highly enriched. These are the highly enriched motifs. This is the random background. What are the highly enriched motifs? I just want, to, want you to look at the first three, which are actually very, very high. First four are very, very high. And the rest are sort of low. The first four, if you notice what they are, it's creation, maturation, maturation. Maturation and maturation. Creation and maturation. There's a creation and maturation step over there. So the most highly enriched motifs have this feature of creating a compartment, and the compartment matures through one or more steps. We did not put it in by hand. Unlike my original model, where I put in maturation, but I had to work really hard to make sure it went through maturation. This model, maturation comes for free. Right? There's another interesting motif down here, which somebody mentioned, where the compartments just become each other. So this corresponds to a compartment changing periodically in time. Okay. Fine. So this is my last slide coming up. If you add up all these motifs, you can put it into a sort of big super motif. That super motif you would not ever find on its own because there's not enough statistical samples. But you can certainly see what I'm talking about. So the super motif that we find is basically this. There's some source compartment which fuses to make some cis type of compartment which matures, matures, matures. The last compartment might just give all its vesicles away or the last compartment might oscillate in time. And we can check again what kinds of things do we get, what kind of cycle lengths, what kind of inlet lengths, what kind of combinations. All that I don't want you to pay attention to. I just want you to look at one very interesting feature we discovered without putting in it. When I take these kinds of uh, networks, I can ask, I take a random pair of compartments. Okay? I take a random pair of compartments where compartment A is giving a vesicle to compartment B. That's not all pairs, just some subset. And then I ask what other features it has. Okay. So here, I take all cases where compartment B is giving a vesicle to compartment A. And then I ask how many of them also have compartment A giving it to compartment B. 
Okay? And I do this for random pairs or pairs that do have this connection to see if there's any influence. So I find that, you know, B giving a vesicle to A has no influence on A giving a vesicle to B because the random choice is the same as the sample choice. Similarly, B giving a vesicle to A has no impact on whether B also matures to A. But B giving a vesicle to A is hugely enriched in A maturing to B. Can somebody give me a simple English explanation for this fact? B giving a vesicle to A is hugely enriched in A maturing to B. Is it obvious? Why? What is the English explanation for this fact? B is giving some stuff to A and so eventually A might become like B. It's not totally obvious because B will also get stuff from other parts of the cell. Yeah? That can happen. The compositions can change, but they can change by giving. I can change to some other composition by giving stuff away to, the, to a third party and getting stuff from a third party. But probably the easiest way for me to become, the easiest way for A to become B is for B to give most of what it has to A. It's probably the easiest way. It's not the only way. So what we find is that the easiest way is the way that almost always happens. And therefore, if you see a maturation chain like that, you almost always will see these backpedaling vesicles, which are called treadmilling vesicles. It's called treadmilling vesicles where the compartments are changing this way, but the vesicle keeps on running back to the older compartment, right? You can imagine the cobblestones are moving that way, and the vesicle keeps jumping back. They're called treadmilling or retrograde vesicles. This is not put into the model. It just drops out statistically. I would not have been able to say this unless I had done statistics, unless I had generated tens of thousands of types of networks and seen that it almost always happens. The question is, does it happen in the real cell? The answer is, in fact, it does. When the Golgi matures, it's immediate retrograde vesicles that drive the maturation. Immediate retrograde vesicles, not connections to the rest of the cell. Okay, so this is my last slide. Now the point is, I didn't, I didn't put that feature of the Golgi apparatus in. In fact, I wasn't even thinking about it when we made the model. It sort of dropped out as a statistical motif. Okay? And these retrograde vesicles were only properly identified, their carriers and their coats, last year. Right? Shortly before we published the paper. So this is cool. It is it's a proper prediction. It's been verified. Okay? Um, now, instead of that, suppose I had shown, instead of this entire talk the way I had done it, suppose I had shown you this structure and I said, well, there's these three compartments and the vesicle. Why would you imagine, if you'd only seen this compartment, that this vesicle mostly fuses to this compartment rather than to any other? Why do you think that would be? There's a very simple reason why it might be, right? It's the nearest one. It's the nearest one. But in fact, in many cells, for example, the yeast cell I showed you, the Golgi is not stacked like this. It's spread throughout the cell. And yet the vesicles do this. So the vesicles must be doing this not because of geometry or physical proximity. They must be doing this because of the chemical specificity, because of their information on their cell surface. It is driven information, informatically. It's not driven through physical localization. At least that's a hypothesis. We've shown that our model, which contains no physical localization, still manages to get this. So that's pretty strong. So you would have imagined it's informational, but you would have been over-interpreting the data. Even when you remove the, sorry, you would have imagined it was geometry, but even when you remove the geometry, you still get it. The second thing, why is there a Golgi apparatus at all? This complicated thing, where the first thing is made, it becomes the second thing, becomes the third thing, becomes the fourth thing, fourth thing vesiculates. Why is there a Golgi apparatus at all? Well, you would say, well, it's there because the cell has to send a protein, it has to go inside the Golgi, it has to be modified, it has to go to the cell cell. You'll make up some story. So the standard move in biology, if you're not well trained, is you look at some complicated thing and then you make up a more complicated story. Right? Which is bad news. Why is there a Golgi apparatus? It's because roughly half the cells at random contain a Golgi apparatus. It would be very surprising if there was not a Golgi apparatus. Okay, so this is, this actually has a name. 
Any evolutionary innovations are non-adaptive. Non-adaptive means they were not selected because they have some strong, useful function. Okay? So there's a very famous paper by Stephen Jay Gould uh, called The Spandrels of San Marco. San Marco is a cathedral, which is this cathedral. And a spandrel is that object there. Right? And these objects, they have often very beautiful paintings of saints. Okay? So were these objects made so that they could paint the saints inside them? If not, can you give me an alternative hypothesis about why these objects exist? Right? That one there. Why do those objects exist? Well, they have to be there, right? Because to hold up a cathedral, you need this arch and you need that dome. Right? When you have a cathedral, these things come for free. Right? So let me read this out. It's very beautiful. An adaptationist program has dominated evolutionary thought based on faith in the power of natural selection as an optimizing agent. Many of you physicists probably start by thinking like this. Some optimizing reason. It proceeds by breaking an organism to unitary traits. So you don't think of the whole organism, you think of only the one you're interested in. Proposing an adaptive story for each considered separately. Trade off among competing demands, exert the only break upon perfection. So the only reason I don't have a tail is because it makes me run less fast. Right? Non-optimality is thereby rendered as a result of adaptation as well. If you see something is non-optimal, you'll say it's non-optimal because something else got optimized. We criticize this approach, attempt to reassert a competing notion. Organisms must be analyzed as integrated wholes, right? Pathways of development and general architecture that the constraints themselves become more interesting and more important in delimiting pathways. What exactly I've shown here? The constraints of vesicle traffic and of the period one fixed point is what generates all the structure. More interesting than the selective force that may mediate change when it occurs. In other words, when you get a Golgi apparatus, it might then be used for something else. Right? So I'll stop with that. I've basically run out of time. You can read about all, uh, well, the Golgi paper you can read here. It's our eLife paper from last year. Other papers on vesicle traffic and, and so on, some of which are uh, bioinformatics, some of which are dynamical systems models are up there. Uh, all my collaborators, various institutions, and you can catch me at these uh, IDs. Okay, thanks. Any questions? So I think you'll be learning about Cytoscape uh, tomorrow or day after tomorrow, which you can use to make all these pretty pictures. Uh, other than that, you will be learning about uh, network analysis and, and so on. So hopefully you'll be able to catch up on all this over the next couple of days. Yeah. So why did you ultimately not need to know kinetic Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, you do need to know. Um, so the there is a regime. There is a regime in which this model looks like that one, and that regime is precisely where that condition entails. Okay. So uh, it is true that some kinetic parameters need to be quite quite a bit bigger than others. But it's not fine-tuned, it's just inequalities. So that's part of the explanation. The rest of it, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. There's no energy function here. There's no, there's no reason to expect something like an energy function or a Lyapunov function. There's no reason to accept, expect a conserved quantity, right? This is a bespoke, it's a made up model, right? You know why you have an energy function in physics? No, no, why does it exist? Why does an energy function exist in physics? No. No. Where does conservation come from? Right, so think about it a bit. We don't put in energy functions to make our life simpler. Energy functions arise in physics because classical mechanics can be written as a Hamiltonian system. I mean, that's one way to say it, right? So and many other systems, there could be things that look like energy functions, but there's hardly any reason to expect them in a generic dynamical system without symmetries. So. Uh, 
Well, okay, look, it's, it's, a, it's, a discrete, it's a discrete or Boolean dynamical system. You could call it cellular automaton, which is also a discrete Boolean dynamical system. No, it almost certainly does not exist. Almost certainly not. Right? Almost all dynamical systems do not have such a conserved function. But you could make others where it exists. But I would say you make the system itself and then if you have some reason to believe it exists, you should start looking at it. It's not a particularly useful way to think about this. But it's, you know, so discovering, you know, Yeah, but that's almost certainly not how it works. So again, one is confusing the fact that a very simple model can explain a very simple phenomenon to saying that that model is true. It's not. Right? The POTS model, uh, model of Hydra reassembly after, or sponge reassembly after breaking up a sponge, um, sure, it sort of works, but it's almost certainly not the way it actually functions. Right? Similarly, your uh, Turing models of pattern formation, except in a few cases, are almost certainly not how stripes are made in, in uh, most biological systems. Right? In almost every case, the physics models have been shown to be, you know, one way to do it out of a million ways to do it, and typically the answer is one of the other 999,000. So it's, it's very difficult. Doing, jumping into biology from physics is very difficult because you immediately go to POTS model, right? I mean, it's too complicated, yeah. Yes. Well, the restrictions are right there, yeah. No, this, this is purely the fact that if you don't have something, you can't give it away. Whether it's because of this, see, it doesn't make sense to simulate a system where... No. Yeah. Sure, that's one way to say it, yes. Well, another way to frame it is, of course, I can, if I wanted to tune it, I can easily tune it so it doesn't have maturation. Right? But I have to work hard. In fact, it's harder to not have maturation. For, uh, the bigger the system gets, the easier it is to get maturation. And the harder it is to tune it so that it has a steady state with no maturing compartments. There are steady states with no maturing compartments. Here they are. Oh, sorry, the other way around. Look at this. Ooh. This is the two-dimensional histogram, right? So there are places with no maturing compartments. They typically have very little homotopic fusion or a lot of homotopic fusion. They exist, but most of it is up here. Right? The fact that I even make statements like that, and most things contain maturing compartments, this is all very new. That's what I call statistical cell biology. But you're almost certain to get this under certain very broad assumptions about the distribution of the underlying parameters. Now, the ideal thing to do would be to, again, do this, but with an exp See, this is a mammalian cell. I should generate also a diagram like this for tens of thousands of species. Now, the sad thing, or maybe the dirty secret is that almost all cells look like this, and I don't understand why. Almost all cells don't look sort of like this. They look exactly like this. Right? And that requires further explanation. More questions? Good questions. Oh, seven was the largest we could uh, usefully simulate within the time frame of the study while still sampling tens of thousands of networks. Oh, yeah, we you know up, up to seven, it all has, I mean, two or three are too restrictive. Four to seven, roughly the same. We haven't done eight, but I don't imagine that these statistics will change drastically with larger numbers over seven. I'll tell you why. Once you get to a large number of molecules, eventually the steady states often discard most of those molecules. And they contain only a small subset of them. Is it like seven have something to No. No. The real biological system typically will have several hundreds. Good question. Thank you.